Okay, welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we are looking at verses 188 to 192, which read as follows. Bahungwe saranangyanti pabatani manusa manusa bayatajita. Netang ko saranang kemang, netang sarana mutamang, netang sarana magamma, sabba dukkha pamuchati. Yocha buddhancha dhammancha sanghancha saranangato, chattari arya satchani, samma panyaya pasati. Dukkhang dukkha samuppadang dukkha. Kasacha atikamang Aryang cha tangikang magang Dukupas samagaminang Etang ko saranang kemang Etang saranamutamang Etang saranamagamma Sambadukha pamuchati So it's a lot, five verses altogether. There's not a lot in there. It's a simple, straightforward, but quite powerful teaching, I think. So this teaching is in regards to refuges. The translation is as follows. Bahungwe saranang yanti. Many go, indeed, for refuge. Sarana. Pabatani vanani cha. To mountains and to forests. Aramaruka chetyani to ashrams, to trees, to jaityas. A jaitya is a shrine, I guess. Nowadays it, we use it to mean this statue or, or large marker in Buddhism, a jaitya or a pagoda. Manusabhayata jita. People go to these places for refuge when they are terrified by fear. Netang ko saranang kemang, this is not a safe refuge. Netang saranamutamang, this is not the highest refuge, or not an ultimate refuge. Netang saranamagamma sabadukha pamuchati, going to such a refuge, uh, such a place for refuge, one doesn't free oneself completely from all suffering. Yocha buddhancha dhammancha sanghancha saranangato. But who goes for refuge to the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha? Chattari arya sachani samma panyaya pasati. Sees the Four Noble Truths with right wisdom. Or rightly with wisdom, maybe. Dukkang dukkha samuppadang dukkha sacha atikamang Suffering, the arising of suffering, the cessation or, or yeah, cessation of suffering, aryang chattangikang magang, and the Eightfold Noble Path, dukkupasamagaminang, the Eightfold Noble Path which leads to the tranquilizing of suffering, or the cessation of suffering. Etang ko saranang kemang. This indeed is the uh, safe refuge. Etang saranamutamang. This is a refuge in the ultimate sense. Etang saranamagama sabbadukha pamuchati. Having gone to such a refuge, one frees oneself from all suffering. This, these verses were taught in regards to uh, agidata. A well, an ascetic, but his story goes that in the time before the Buddha, he was the minister or or advisor to the king of the Kosala country, and when the king died, he became advisor to King Pasenadi Kosala, who was the king of Kosala in the time of the Buddha. Kosala was one of the kingdoms in that time. And the story goes that 
Pasenadi was very good to this uh, Agidatta, yeah, out of reverence for his father and, and reverence for him as, as his father's advisor. He took him as his, his own advisor, but held him up as an equal to himself. So normally when a king would sit higher than everyone else, he would sit with Agidatta, he would have Agidatta sit equal to him and treat him with great respect uh, as his advisor. Agidatta thought to himself something that's a little bit interesting because um, even though Pasenadi was treating him very well, he thought to himself, well, kings are unpredictable. And today he's treating me well, but who knows what the future will bring. Maybe one day he'll have a whim and he'll decide he no longer has need for me. I, I think there's some underlying context here because Pasenadi was not uh, an enlightened being by any means. He had a lot of uh, his own attachments and partialities and so on, and he appears to have been a little bit of a rough sort of character. And so I imagine some of the things he saw Pasenadi doing, killing and, and beheading and going to war and the greed and so on, the whim. Pasenadi was a good person, I think, in, in some ways, but he wasn't a great person. And so... Uh, Agidatta, probably seeing this, thought to himself, mm, they're, they're, he realized, and I think even deeper, on, on a deeper level. Um, well, there's a teaching here, and it's this um, realization that there's a lot of suffering involved and, and, and potential to living in, a, in lay life, uh, living in any situation where you have to put up with the whims of others. When you have a boss, when you have a master, when you have even just fellows in life, competition and relationships and society, all the many people we have to meet with in society are uh, some good, some bad, but there's many challenges and, and potential for great suffering. And so he probably started to realize all of this, that um, this life as a minister was not all that was cracked up to be. There was still something missing and there was still this insecurity. He would have seen all of the suffering that comes to the people who commit bad deeds or people who were victims of others' bad deeds. He would have seen how the king sometimes made mistakes or followed his own partiality and did bad thing, bad deeds. And he would have started, he seemed to have started to realize that life in, in this sphere is not safe. There's the, always the potential for suffering, for someone to uh, harm me or to... Um, manipulate me in various ways. So he decided that this was no longer the life for him and he asked permission to leave the kingdom. And he ended up shaving off his hair and beard and putting on a robe or some such thing and, and not becoming a Buddhist monk but going off and becoming an ascetic. And they say he took a whole bunch of people with him and ended up being a fairly well-established teacher. Uh, not Not as an advisor to the king but as a teacher to people who were also interested in leaving the household life. And the way he would instruct people, based on this sort of wisdom that he had gained, which I think is, is perfectly valid and valuable, uh, this wisdom that the living in society, living amongst people is fraught with danger. You're always subject to their whims and proclivities and their defilements, your defilements, and the conflicting of defilements, the conflicting of unwholesome mind states. If you are, if I want something and you want something, we fight over it. If I'm prone to anger and you're prone to anger, we will fight, and so on. So he, based on this, he taught his students to leave society. He said, true refuge is on the mountains. It's in the forests. It's in it's under the trees and, 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 and so on and so on. It's in these lonely places. Leave behind people, leave behind society, 
and you'll find refuge at the top of a mountain or deep in the jungle. And he taught his students one other thing that's sort of incidental to the story, that um, he said, any time when you're living alone, you uh, give rise to some unwholesome action or speech or thought, take a jar and go down to the river and scoop some sand into the jar and bring it and dump it right in this one place. And they designated a place where they would all come and bring this sand and they, they would have a pot full of sand for every time they did something wrong. It was kind of a something, some cultural, you know, some uh, teaching method of his to, to help people to recognize and admit their failings and their faults, which I think is also quite wholesome. And eventually, as, as these uh, people were off in the forest, and I guess he didn't have anything much more profound than that to teach them. Well, ob absolutely, they were going to still give rise to unwholesomeness. And so this sand pile started to accumulate, and it got bigger and bigger until eventually it became a shrine. It became a, a very special place, and people would come and worship it. And the story goes that there was a dragon living there, some kind of a snake king, like in, in one of our previous stories. Uh, decided to live there and was living in this sand pile. And then comes along the Buddha. So this is the introduction to the story. This uh, ascetic, a teacher of ascetics, was off living on his own, preaching about the refuge of the solitary places. And so the Buddha sent Moggallana, and he said to Moggallana, go and teach this guy uh, what, what's wrong, what, what he's, what's wrong with what he's saying. And Moggallana went, and the story goes that he ended up, well, he asked for permission to stay with these guys. He was going to spend some time there and maybe question them about their views and tell them about his own views and so on. But they wouldn't, they wouldn't let him stay. The head, the, this Agidatta said, there's no room for you. I don't know if he was afraid or just didn't like Buddhism or something, uh, didn't like these... Uh, ascetics, his disciples of the ascetic Gotama. But they wouldn't let him stay. And he said, well, what about that sand pile? Can I stay on that sand pile? And he said, oh, no, there's a great Naga a dragon living there. And he said, oh, that's fine. I'll go and stay with him. And he said, oh, that dragon is very temperamental. He'll surely kill you. And Moggallana had magical powers. So in the morning, anyway, that, that part of the story is really inconsequential to our teaching. I mean, it's, this is the fantastical part that I'm, I fully uh, am willing to accept that uh, many people will not believe that part. So, absolutely optional. You don't have to concern yourself with that. But the story goes that Moggallana went and uh, subdued the dragon, and then in the morning he was sitting and they came to the sand pile thinking, I wonder if he's still alive or if the snake, if the dragon killed him. But he was sitting on top of the sand pile and the dragon was, the snake was, uh, extended its hood like a cobra over Moggallana. And then that, that day the Buddha came and Moggallana got down and the Buddha went up and sat on the sand pile and he talked to Agidata. Agidata came and talked to him and he talked to Agidata and said, what is it you teach? And Agidata told him, I teach this. This is what I teach my students. So barring the whole dragon part, it's a simple story of a monk off in, uh, an ascetic off in the forest teaching his students to find true refuge in solitude. It's quite simple. The Buddha said that's not true solitude, that's not true refuge, it's not safe. You're telling these people they're going to be safe from defilements, they bring all their defilements with them. And so he taught these verses. So from the story, I think one important lesson we can gather is what, what Agidata got right, and that is the, the nature of the household life, and how powerful it is to leave behind the household life. You give up so much, you give up a lot of wealth and pleasure and, and ease and comfort, but you gain a great amount of safety and security. 
not not real and true safety and security. We'll get to why. Obviously, that should be fairly obvious why this guy had the wrong idea. But there is a certain amount of safety and security that comes because there's no thieves, there's no murderers, there's no um, temptations, there's no addictions. Right? If you live off in the forest, maybe these guys were living off of fruits and nuts and leaves, whatever they could gather in the forest. So they're living a very simple life. Probably they had simple robes. Some of them even more just tree bark. They had special. They had from certain trees. You could get this sort of soft cloth from the tree bark. Like you just cut the tree bark off and wear it, something like that. And maybe they would go naked even. Uh, and these were all very simple ways of living. It was a, it was a way of answering this question of how you escape, how you find security. Um, when it seems like anywhere you go in, in society, any path that you pick is fraught with danger and, and uncertainty. The, the falling prey and, and being a victim of the whims of other people and, and of society in, in general. Um, so this is an important teaching. It's an important thing to realize that there are ways and there are alternatives and there is a way of living, a choice we can make to live our life more simply and that there's a great security that comes from that. But the, the verse teaching is, I suppose, more core and more important. It's the difference between finding uh, safety, security, peace, happiness in physical things in your physical location, right? People come to our meditation center sometimes thinking that um, they're going to be able to leave behind all of their problems. I mean, quite often, to be honest, people will come and think that meditation should be quite peaceful and comfortable and pleasant. They should be able to leave behind all the suffering of life. Um, people become monks for the same reason. I often get requests from people to give information that they want help with becoming a monk, and I tend to dismiss it because too often we see people who are focused on becoming a monk have the wrong attitude, the wrong, their inclination is to run away and they end up complaining and um, suffering and, and not feeling, not being able to fit in or, or live or be, become comfortable as a monk because they're unable to face the suffering and the, the problems that exist inside. And that's the point, is you come here to our meditation center to face your problems, not to leave them behind. You become a monk to face life, to face your problems. So going to the, going to the f mountains or to the forests or to a tree or anywhere and thinking that you're going to find safety there is ridiculous. It's, it's in fact, in, 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 on an, in a deep sense, it's the opposite of what's going to happen. A person who goes off into the forest without any guidance is going to have a large pile of sand, if that's the thing. They're going to have done a lot of bad uh, deeds of, of action, speech, and, and thought. There's nothing to temper them. You know, they might even go crazy because they have to face themselves. When you go off into the forest, off into the mountain, the first part of what I said is true. You gain some security from the outside. And what's great about it, and why the Buddha recommended it, certainly, as, as a part of the practice, is because it gives you the opportunity to face your demons. You can't face them in society. You're constantly bombarded by other people. You're forced to engage with and to get involved with their problems and their situations. So facing your own demons is very difficult when you're living in society. And that's the reason why one should leave. Not because one wants to run away, but because one wants to do good work, hard work, the hardest work perhaps. And that's the work of purifying your own mind, fighting your own demons, fighting your demons, not running away from them. And so that's why the Buddha said, these, are not, these things are not a refuge. You can't take refuge in these things and hope to these places and hope to be safe. No, the true refuge is the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. 
and particularly the Four Noble Truths, as you notice that's what the Buddha talked about here. He, he doesn't just talk about, doesn't just mention the three refuges, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. He specifically brings out the Four Noble Truths, which I think is important and worth commenting on. But the second part is the um, teaching that the three refuges, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, are truly safe and ultimate refuge. The Buddha is a refuge. The Buddha is a refuge in a physical sense, on a superficial level, because living with the Buddha is a great support for your practice. If any of us had the opportunity to be with the Buddha and were open to it and um, had the great capacity in our in our hearts to listen to the Buddha's teaching, then it would be a great support. It would be a great refuge to have the the honor and the opportunity to hear the Buddha's teaching and to follow his teaching directly. It would be a great refuge. But that's not, of course, the in the deeper sense. Taking refuge in the Buddha is a psychological thing. It's a mental thing. When you intend, when you say to yourself, um, "I will follow the teachings of the Buddha," when when someone goes to the Buddha and uh, accepts, puts themselves in in the position of a student, lowers himself and and puts the Buddha up, "You are my teacher," and and makes a, a promise or an, an intention to f to do what the Buddha tells them to do, to follow his teachings, to practice accordingly. That's what it means to take refuge in the Buddha. It doesn't mean you have to, you know, vow your life to the Buddha and you know be convert to Buddhism. That's not what I'm saying. It's um, the sort of thing we do when a person comes to do a meditation course here in in a traditional setting. Here we haven't started doing it, but I've thought about making it optional. We would do a traditional opening ceremony where one would take the refuges and the precepts, but more importantly, one would ask for the meditation practice, please teach me, and would say, I give myself over to the Buddha. For the duration of this course, I give myself over. I'm no longer going to follow my own whims. I'm no longer going to be in charge. I'm not going to have any say. I'm going to listen, follow, and practice whatever you tell me to do. You know, putting yourself in that position is a part of what it means to take refuge. You really wholeheartedly say, I go to the Buddha. I'm, I'm putting myself under their care, under their protection. The Dhamma is the refuge, of course, is the, the most central part of the Buddhist teaching, is that the, the practice itself, we practice the Dhamma in order to realize the Dhamma. This is the, great, the most central refuge. How is the Dhamma the refuge? Because this is what truly leads to safety. It's, it's a safety in the path, in the practice, and it's a safety in the result. The safety in the practice is you start, you, you are kept in a, um, a, a, what is it, a, a fortress, sort of. You are kept uh, safe, safe from, safe from your own defilements, from your own unwholesome thoughts. When you when you give rise to anger and you're mindful, it's able to cut off and prevent you from shouting or hurting other people with speech or action. It's even capable of preventing anger from arising or greed from arising or arrogance, conceit or all these things from arising. If you're skilled and capable of being mindful in the present moment, and you're able to cut it off, and you know, when you have pain, for example, and you say to yourself, pain, pain, there's no reaction to it, no anger need to arise. When you see something you like or feel something pleasant, there's a feeling, feeling, or seeing, seeing, or, or whatever it might be, and you don't give rise to the unwholesomeness. So the Dhamma, the practice of it is a great refuge. And what it leads to, the wisdom that it leads to, the Buddha said, samapanyaya pasati, when you see with wisdom, uh, is, is the ultimate refuge, is the, the highest and most supreme refuge, that's uh, freedom from suffering. Because what happens as you start to see things clearly and are more objective is you start to let go. You start to see the difference between clinging to things which leads to suffering 
and objective, equanimous observation, which keeps you free from suffering. And you see that more clearly and more clearly until finally your mind lets go, there's a realization, nothing's worth clinging to. And you let go. The Sangha as the refuge is, I think, um, underappreciated. The Sangha is an important refuge, it's an important one of these three. It's most important for us, but even in the time of the Buddha, uh, the Buddha was constantly reminding his students about the importance of the Sangha. Because it's the Sangha that uh, carries out and protects and supports the Buddha's teaching, supports the practice. That's not doesn't even have to be the Buddha's teaching, just the practice of goodness. Sangha means community. It's the community of people who have practiced rightly, who are able to help others practice, who are um, practicing together as a support, as a model, as a, an example for others. And um, th th those who provide advice and, and encouragement. And those who simply remember the Buddha's teaching and pass them on and protect them. Those who keep the Buddha's teaching, writing them down and memorizing them chanting them and teaching them and so on. All of this is the Sangha and it's a great refuge. It's a refuge because of the teachings that we get, just the information alone, all of the, the books that we have on the Buddha's teaching, it's all because of the Sangha. And so the Sangha is providing this to us, their support, their protection, keeping us um, in the realm of, of right view by giving us teachings that teach right view, how to see things in the right way. It's a great support. Um, I think more, more deeply there's also the idea of the, the teacher. So you know, we don't call, I don't call myself a teacher or anything, but the, a person who gives teaching is someone we should take refuge in. And so we, during the meditation course, we put ourselves in their um, in their protection as well. So we say, I, I give myself over to you, uh, I will follow the things you say, that sort of thing. And by doing that, that's a great protection for us. Uh, it, it gives a certain sincerity and, and wholeheartedness and, and freedom from fear or doubt or worry. Just having someone, you know, the, the, the great difference between practicing on your own at home trying to decide for yourself what is the correct way to practice, and having someone who will guide you, lead you. It's, it's night and day, really. Anyone who's done these courses, sometimes it seems magical how easy it is when you have a teacher, how much easier it is, and how much more powerful and how much further you can go when you have someone guiding you. So taking that as our refuge, just coming to do a meditation course or finding a teacher somewhere is a great refuge. If they're teaching, if they're actually the Sangha and are teaching the Buddha's teaching. And the last part of the verse, um, or the last uh, point in, in the set of verses, is the Four Noble Truths. Now, it said that the Buddha tried always to include the Four Noble Truths in his teaching because it's the core message, it's the essence of what the Buddha taught and if you, if you miss that, you haven't actually taught the Buddha's teaching. If you teach something off to the side, or that, that's not touching upon at least in some way the Four Noble Truths, you haven't actually gotten to the point, you've missed that which will lead people to freedom from suffering. Right? Because that's what the Four Noble Truths are. So, the, but, but in another sense, the Four Noble Truths are a refuge. The Buddha doesn't say that exactly. But as the core of the Dhamma, it's clear that they are a refuge. Suffering is a refuge. Suffering as a teaching is a refuge. Suffering is not a refuge. But the, the understanding of suffering is the greatest refuge. When you see what it is that causes you suffering, when you see what it is that um, is, is going to hurt you if you cling to it, then of course that's the greatest refuge because then you don't cling to it. So this is the idea in Buddhism of why we suffer is because we cling to things. The second noble truth, the cause of suffering, is craving or clinging. 
And so when you start to see that these things that we cling to are suffering, are stressful, when you see that are trying to control things, when you see that are stressing out over things or getting angry about things or clinging to things or needing things, when you see that that is suffering, you let go of it, you stop. You no longer engage in those activities. Why? Because they cause you suffering. So the first noble truth, just understanding suffering, is a great refuge. Uh, the second noble truth is a refuge but when, you, when it's abandoned. Abandoning craving, of course, is, means no suffering. It's what comes from seeing the first noble truth clearly. The third noble truth is, is Nibbana, freedom from suffering. So it is the highest refuge. And the fourth noble truth is the path. So again, getting back to practice as a refuge. Just having a path of practice is, is a huge safety. Again, as I said, it's like having a fortress. So the path which leads to cessation from suffering is the ultimate practical refuge because it not only, would, not only it leads to Nibbana, but because it protects us. It's a way of life. It's a way of being that is simple, pure, and perfect if you can put it into practice. So that's the Dhammapada for today. Really a reminder that the greatest refuge is our practice and our, our commitment to, I guess, the organization in a sense. The organization, or whatever word you want to use, religion maybe, that includes uh, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. But it includes them as a program by which we practice to free ourselves from suffering. There's no great refuge that comes from being here or being there, or having this or having that. Even just being at a meditation center or becoming a monk is not a true refuge. Refuge has to be deeper. True refuge, true safety. Another place the Buddha said it's the four foundations of mindfulness. So in the Eightfold Noble Path, the path that leads to freedom from suffering, we have the four foundations of mindfulness, sort of as the practical aspect there, what you engage in in, in a practical sense when you cultivate meditation. When you're doing walking or sitting, you're cultivating the four foundations of mindfulness and all the other parts of the Eightfold Noble Path. But it means you make yourself a refuge. The Buddha said, Atahi atano nato. One should be one's own protector or refuge. And the way you do that is through your practice. So, another good teaching, and very core uh, teaching in the Buddha's uh, Dhamma. So, that's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for listening.